um, sort of financial challenges, um, and I think you've recognised in your Vision 2020 plan that delivering that will require new ways of working, uh, working with partners and new sort of skills and attributes, which I think that's recognised. Um, there are still some areas where we still need to improve some of the basic processes, and we talk in the report about um, still the need to improve elements around procurement, but the elements are on the way on that, and also the arrangements around um, dealing with and trying to address some of this absence as well. So the that is you're aware of that and work is underway. <coughs> so um, looking ahead, we've sort of identified three main areas that we think we should put cash to focus on. So there's one about continuing to improve and embed basic arrangements, uh, basic processes. Um, continuing to identify and work on those new ways of working and new ways of delivering services that we clearly have to be addressed. And that's the case across all of local government, it's fair to say. Uh, and finally, they're just maintaining that focus on that significant financial challenge you've got over the next couple of years. Again, which is common to lots of local authorities. Um, so having said all of that, bringing all that together, um, you know, satisfied the council has got appropriate arrangements in place to secure uh, value for money and use of resources, and my intention will be to issue an unqualified value for money conclusion, and um, confirm that's still the case. So that's a little bit about the value for money conclusion. Finally, I've started to set up around some independence arrangements. So I think it's about to refer you to, I think, to page 27 of your papers. We've got there the details of uh, the fees that we've charged for the audit this year. So there's a fee for the main audit, which um, for those of you with members will remember, that was set by the Audit Commission before they were abolished. Uh, so that's a sort of set fee, and there's the fee around the audit of the welfare benefits and how to benefit. Um, we've also provided some fees for other services as well. So we've done the audit and teachers' pension return, we're doing work on the regional growth fund and some additional work on how to benefits arrive from the qualification of previous years. So those are additional fees. We need to have page 27, we've got our two questions. Oh, right. Double numbers, oh, right. page 33. Okay. So uh, and we've also provided a non related service that's based analytics subscription so that the council's agreed to sign up to the place analytics, which is a geographical based system which provides you information on um, levels of uh, educational attainment and growth and, um, and issues around employability in different parts of the borough. You can pay yourself against different parts of rural but also in different parts of the country. So, just to be clear to members that before any of those services are provided, um, we have to go through a process to get that work authorised and approved by our ethics partner to make sure that there's no impediment on independence. So those are a bit of the sort of key findings and reports set out there. So finally, just in terms of what I'm asking you to do, so um, I'm asking you to sort of note the report, note the uh, findings on our audit, to note the uh, intended uh, unqualified opinion on the account and the unqualified value from the conclusion. Um, and then just to sort of, you know, subject to you approving the accounts and approving the letter of presentation to us later on in the meeting. Uh, our intention is to issue an unqualified uh, conclusion, unqualified value for the conclusion of the opinion. So that's, so I hope that's helpful just in terms of the report on the council audit. Um, you'll also know there's a similar report for this for the pension fund accounts, which has obviously already been uh, considered by the pensions committee, as I understand it. So that report's on there as well, and that also sets out the intention issue. On what part of the on the pension fund accounts and uh, the report. Um, so I hope that's helpful for members in terms of setting out what's there. Um, finally, for me, just as thanks in terms of the considerable work done by the team and also by Tom and his team as well, uh, Peter, in terms of the work that we do around the whole of the So, um, you know, much appreciated. A lot of work goes on to get to this point in time. Uh, happy to take any questions, Jerry. Well, yeah, I don't know if there's a question for you, but I don't know if there's a question for Tom. Can you explain to me on page 39, paragraph 2, which is on that line, uh, what this historic debt, how it can be treated as historic debt itself? The historic debt relates to
seeing that as being a positive thing to engage on it. So I think those are the sorts of areas that I would, I would cover. And I think we've, um, in a number of, certainly a number of councils we've worked in, particularly in London, um, have helped to support the sort of that change program, sort of looking at the, sort of the skills that staff have is actually starting to change in terms of the, you know, partnership working, the taking, you know, wanting to take risks, if you like, you know, manage friends, um, to try and help that what we call, you know, wider sense of cultural change.
in terms of what else you've got there, the package will include will be 30, so I'll just go through that. And again, it's sort of all qualified for the region. Some work to be done there, particularly about going forward. But the vision 2020 work, how that develops, what I'll take on that journey. The letter of representation, which is appended, is a statement from the council, or from myself and the chair, to say what's been included in the accounts. That's to give to the auditor, so you can release the opinion, give some background to what's been taken into account in the accounts. The annual governance statement, which includes in the statement, when we produce the draft, include the draft annual governance statements. Members will be aware of audit committee last week, we gave you the updated annual governance statement. That is what we've got in the appendix today. So in terms of what we need to do going forward, so the key thing is that there's been no change in the outcome of the audit, there's no change in the financial position of the council, which is excellent news. Um, of course, I'd like to as well thank the work of the auditors. It's a cha this is a challenging period every year. Every year the deadline seems to get closer and closer, but we've made it again, thank God. And again, as I said, the positive is it's an unqualified conclusion for the So, in terms of the recommendations, now you consider the audit findings report. I said there were no changes to those the accounts that require you to consider. The findings are value for money, you can see those, and it's unqualified conclusion. And you can see the action plans appended to the audit findings report. That will now be correct. Item 62 uh, is about signing off the accounts. In previous years, when we produced the report, there's been outstanding items at this stage. That's the delegates of authority for myself and the chair to complete the accounts. At this stage, there are now outstanding items. So, I'll probably delete that one. Uh, so, I'm asking the chair at this stage to sign the date of letter of representation, which is appended to this one. Probably saw that right after the meeting, I'll go now. So, what page is that? That's on page letter of Yeah. Yes, there was some money that came back to us to do with the asset transfer. We've 
an element left to still sitting there. Some of it's allocated to trees, but it's in all books. But then I'm allocating funds. A lot of it's allocated. I think there's some money in that's not allocated this way, just to whether it's being spent in the facility. But yeah. there are plans in place to spend that money. Oh, no, it's, sitting in all, it's sitting in all books. Yeah, it's only when it's allocated.
in 2013, um, and, and even before. Money was available, but was never spent uh, until around about 2013. They started putting plans together to invest, reinvest in IT. And in 2014, those plans started to be implemented. Uh, the most visible of those uh, projects that certainly you would have been aware of it would have been the Windows 7 rollout where members and offices had their laptops and desktop computers in place, uh, which was a, a large risk for the council because at that time uh, the operating system Windows XP was out of support. Um, we could have paid Microsoft half a million pounds to provide another 12 month support, but to, you know, to be providing half a million pounds year on year just to support something that eventually has to be replaced is, is untenable. Uh, we had to buy the bullet and that was the biggest lesson, the biggest of the project. The other things that we've done uh, to help to mitigate are listed from uh, section 2.3, into section 2.3 of my report. So the, the Windows, as I said, the Windows 7 uh, project, the uh, storage area network, that's basically updating and renewing the, the main corporate storage. So as opposed to the hard disks you have in your PCs and your, and your laptops, we've got racks full of them in the data centers uh, and they provide the they provide the storage for everybody's email and all of the other uh, corporate so, uh, systems such as the finance system, social care, etc. Um, and then as we go through the, the other projects there, virtualization, the SQL database platform, email, etc., are all um, designed to improve availability, reliability, and to reduce the risk of uh, the council losing information or failing to provide its uh, IT uh, provision successfully. So, uh, by you know, if you have a failure. So, for instance, virtualization, which uh, is, a, is a technique of, uh, which allows us to First of all, make best use of the hardware that we have. So uh, what we virtualization allows us to do is to take one server and uh, make a number of different applications think they have complete control of that server. So instead of, it's a way of getting a, a quart out of a pint pot. So, in the old days where most applications had a server and one application would be served on that server, if you had the ability to look at the utilization of those resources, you'd probably find about 20% of the resources were being used. So what virtualization allows us to do, it's a, it's a software layer that we put in, it allows us then to use more servers on the one box. So we have three, four, five, and so on, depending on the, the, the type of virtualization platform you're using and the density <coughs> that you want to do. So that's the primary aim of virtualization, it allows you to make it better use and get value for money out of hardware. It also allows, uh, if it's like what we've got, the VMware, allows us to automatically shift servers around, virtual servers around. So, the situation we're in at the moment is if we have a failure in a piece of hardware that is running, say, the account system, the virtualization platform will move that virtual server to another piece of hardware that is working, alert us that there's a problem, but the finance department and all the use of the finance system should not know that there's a problem. They will continue working, we can get on and get partners in or whoever to fix the broken piece of hardware while everything carries on as well. Um, similarly with the, the high availability uh, Microsoft 
a SQL database platform. We're shifting our, uh, our database uh, requirements into that platform because in the same way as virtualization allows us to shift servers around on the fly, this, as its name alludes, high availability, it gives us high availability again. It's much more resilient, more fault tolerant, it can recover itself without us getting involved, it alerts us to a problem that we can then deal with in the background while users carry on working. Um, the email Office 365 project which is underway at the moment is due uh, to start going into a small, limited pilot next week, uh, which will run for about three weeks, then we'll have a two-week hold your breath to see what the testing threw up. And assuming nothing uh, dramatic has gone wrong, we will be moving everybody, members and staff, onto this uh, email Office 365 platform uh, within the next few months, and there will be more communications around that for everyone. Sorry to interrupt, how will that, will that change the appearance of our... The, if you're using Office uh, Outlook Web Access, the web one, it will look different. It will be more in different colours and, uh, and, and some of the menu options will be in slightly different places, but that will be covered with communications and extra uh, information for you. Just on, on the remote access that they have, mm -hmm. I've got to uh, my emails are accessed remotely. Yes. Uh, so I get them sent to my iPad. It's cloud-based yeah. uh, through an app. What impact will it have on that? No, Not because this is cloud-based. So it just feels like the automatic migrating across. You will get, yeah. yeah. So I wouldn't have to do anything other than what you should, you should have to do nothing. I have asked what will be the impact to people who are getting email from their web browser, whether it's on an iPad or on their phone or, or uh, on a laptop, uh, remotely. And I'm told that apart from the visual change, because it's a much more up-to-date version, so as I said, many options may be in slightly different places, Everything else should remain the same, so when you click on the, the link to take you to the email, you should all get the email. Right, thank you. Just as it doesn't work on the iPhone. It works on the iPhone, but how does it work on the iPhone? Well, if that's a council iPhone, then... That's mine. Ah, well that's... Yeah, the iPhone's mine, that's why I ask you. Well, there... It's not working. Well, you're lucky that it's working on your iPad, because actually the government, PSN, Accreditation regulations have asked us to stop allowing private access because of the risks around us not knowing whether your iPad is vulnerable to viruses or attack by hackers. But if it just sent an email, mm -hmm. like, I get my emails and stuff, so yeah. it doesn't I've got a desktop mm -hmm. computer. Um, I spend more of my time outside of where my desktop computer is than I do with the desktop computer. I'm out and about. I have constant access to my email and I'm out and about by the iPad. Yeah. Well, we have, we would. That's through one of your approved uh, apps, which is the full uh, action. Ron, can we? Yeah, if you want to discuss this on how it's supposed to be in this it's very important that we get, the, we get our things working right because I understand that the vulnerability and the viruses and so forth, it's about exchanging information. It's about you sending the information. Yeah, but it's also about us providing for rural residents the security to know that we are secure and that when they transact digitally with us, that our systems will look after their personal information and that we're not doing anything that exposes them to risk. Uh, and so I mean, anything... Through the lack of VAP, anyway, mm -hmm. that yeah. it. Yeah. We are, we are, there are a number of other things we're looking at which will further improve the situation and allow uh, access by iPads uh, 
but generally the government would rather we own and control every device that leads to that no, the device you have got, if it's your device. Yeah, but the, the app is your app. Yeah. I, I will just uh, quote the, from CESG, the Central Electronic uh, Surveillance Group, which is part of GCHQ, that can actually they are able to control all of these regulations for us. Dr. Ian Levy, who's the technical director, was quoted last year as saying, if you don't trust the hardware, you cannot trust the software that's on it. Because there are apps out there that will lie to you and tell you that they're okay. No, but it's, it's like, like I'm, I'm sorry to do but I've got also another little tap. Mm -hmm. It's called a good app, but it's a mental travel app. It yes. allows me to access my mental travel emails. And, that, and, is exactly the, and that is exactly in the same position as, as I was quoting from Dr. E. Lee, in fact. Good was the thing that was given to him and said, well, we're using this, this should be good enough. It used to be good enough. And he said, no, if you don't trust the hardware, you cannot trust anything that's on it. And if you don't control the hardware, you cannot trust the hardware. Yes. Yeah. 